Gandhi, Dr. King, dramatized and defined the technique of nonviolence, and yet he also said that the only alternative to fear is violence, and that if that were the alternative, he would have to choose violence. Do you subscribe to that judgment of Gandhi, or would you disavow violence under any condition? Well, I think I would have to somewhat interpret Gandhi at this point. I don't think he was setting forth violence as, a, as an alternative. I think he was emphasizing, uh, or, or rather trying to refute an all too prevalent fallacy. And that is that the persons who use uh, the method of nonviolence are actually the weak persons persons who don't have the weapons of violence, persons who are afraid. And I think that is what Gandhi was attempting to refute. Now, in that instance, I would agree with Gandhi that if the only alternative to violence, uh, uh, to fear, uh, is violence and vice versa, then I would say fight. But it isn't the only alternative. And that is the one point that Gandhi was trying to bring out. It seems to me that there are three ways that oppressed people can deal with their oppression. What are they, Dr. King? Well, one is to rise up in the open violence, in physical violence. And some persons have used that method, persons who have been oppressed. But I think the danger of that method is its futility. I feel that violence creates many more social problems than it solves. May I interrupt you there, Dr. King? There are today certainly people who are forced to endure a kind of injustice that neither you nor even Gandhi in his time had ever seen. Uh, for example, would you regard the martyrs of Hungary's rebellion a year ago as misguided men and having used violence? I admire freedom fighters wherever they are. But I still believe that nonviolence is the strongest approach. I think that would apply to the Hungarian situation also. I don't think it's limited to a particular locality. I think it uh, should apply in every situation in the world where individuals seek to break a loose from the bondage of colonialism or from some totalitarian regime or from the system which we confront in America. You truly believe, then, that nonviolence is the sole, the universal answer to injustice and oppression? Very and definitely. Lasting Very definitely. I feel that um, nonviolence, organized, I should say, organized uh, nonviolent resistance is the most powerful weapon, weapon that oppressed people can use in breaking a loose from the bondage of oppression. Now, the other method that one might use is that of resignation or acquiescence. But I think that is just as bad as violence, because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. You make a difference, a distinction between passive resistance and non-violent resistance, is that it? Well, I, I think that can be something of a semantical problem. Uh, if passive resistance means uh, just passively accepting violence or injustice, if it means uh, cowardice and stagnant passivity, then there is a difference because nonviolent resistance th does resist. It is dynamically active. It is passive uh, physically, but it is strongly active spiritually. I believe firmly in nonviolence, as I have already said. But at the same time, I am not an anarchist. Now, some pacifists are anarchists following Tolstoy, but I don't go that far. I, I believe in the intelligent use of police force. I think uh, one who believes in nonviolence must recognize the dimensions of evil within human nature. And there is a danger that one can indulge in a sort of superficial optimism thinking man is all good. Man does not only have the greater capacity for goodness, but there is also the potential for evil. And I think of that throughout my whole philosophy, and I'm, I try to be realistic at that point. So that I believe in the intelligent use of police force, and I think that is all we have in Little Rock. It's not an army fighting against a nation or a race of people it is just police force seeking to enforce the law of the land. I came to Gandhi 
In the same setting, in theological seminar days, I had heard of Gandhi, but I remembered hearing a message by the president of Howard University, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who had just returned from India. He spoke in Philadelphia on his trip to India and the whole philosophy of Gandhi and uh, passive and nonviolent resistance. And I was so deeply moved by the message that I went away and bought several books on the Gandhian, uh, on Gandhi and Gandhian technique. And at that point, I became deeply influenced by Gandhi, never realizing that uh, I would live in a situation where it would be useful and meaningful. Christmas Eve, 1940. Dear friend, the fact that I call you a friend is not just me trying to be polite. We should be friends with everyone, no matter what color their skin is or where they come from or what their religion is. We have no doubt that you are brave and devoted to your country. And of course, we don't think that you are a monster. But the things that you and your friends and followers have said and done are indeed monstrous. I'm aware that you see this destruction as something good. We can't possibly wish you success in what you are trying to do. But we have a unique position here. The British are basically doing the same thing to us as your Nazis are doing to Europe. The only difference may be in the level at which this happens here versus there. But our resistance to the British government doesn't mean harming the British people. We want to change their minds and actions, not kill them. Whether we can change their mind or not, we are determined to make it impossible for them to abuse us anymore. But we do this in a non-violent way by not cooperating with them. It's based on the knowledge that a criminal can't get what he wants without some form of cooperation. Our abusers may have our country and our bodies, but they won't get our souls. We have been trying to free ourselves from British domination for the past 50 years and our movement has never been so strong as it is now. It's do or die without the killing or hurting from our part, which is the exact opposite of what you are doing. It's amazing that you don't see how violence can't be contained. If the British don't defeat you by using your own ways of violence, then somebody else will eventually come along and do it. You are not leaving behind anything for your people to be proud of. They are not going to take pride in this cruel performance, however skillfully you plan it. So I am asking you, in the name of humanity, to stop the war. If you win the war, it won't prove that you were right. It will only prove that you were more violent. I recently asked every British person to follow my method. The British people see me as a friend, even though I am a rebel in the eyes of government. Is it too much to ask you to make an effort for peace? It would mean so much to the millions of suffering Europeans who are crying so loudly for peace that I can hear them. I wanted to write to Mr. Mussolini, whom I had the pleasure of meeting when I was in Rome. I hope he sees this letter as addressed to him as well as that he makes the necessary changes. I am your sincere friend, M. K. Gandhi. The good man is the friend of all living things. A man is but the product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes.
strength does not come from physical capacity it comes from an indomitable will first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you then you win in matters of conscience the law of the majority has no place the real ornament of a woman is her character her purity an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind the weak can never forgive forgiveness is the attribute of the strong non cooperation with evil is as much a duty as is cooperation with good an ounce of practice is worth more than tons of preaching best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others in a gentle way you can shake the world there is an indefinable mysterious power that pervades everything i feel it though i do not see it it is this unseen power which makes itself felt and yet defies all proof because it is so unlike all that i perceive through my senses it transcends the senses but it is possible to reason out the existence of god to a limited extent even in ordinary affairs we know that people do not know who rules or why and how he rules and yet they know that there is a power that certainly rules in my tour last year in mysore i met many poor villagers and i found upon inquiry that they did not know who ruled mysore they simply said some god ruled it if the knowledge of these poor people was so limited about their ruler i who am infinitely lesser in respect to god then they to their ruler need not be surprised if i do not realize the presence of god the king of kings nevertheless i do feel as the poor villagers felt about my soul that there is orderliness in the universe there is an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists or lives it is not a blind law for no blind law can govern the conduct of living beings and thanks to the marvelous researches of sir j c bose it can now be proved that even matter is life that law then which governs all life is god law and the lawgiver are one i may not deny the law or the lawgiver because i know so little about it or him just as my denial or ignorance of the existence of an earthly power will avail me nothing even so my denial of god and his law will not liberate me from its operation whereas humble and mute acceptance of divine authority makes life's journey easier even as the acceptance of earthly rule makes life under it easier i do dimly perceive that while everything around me is ever changing ever dying there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless
that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power of spirit is God, and since nothing else that I see, merely through the senses, can or will persist, he alone is. And is this power benevolent or malevolent? I see it as purely benevolent, for I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. But he is no God who merely satisfies the intellect if he ever does. God, to be God, must rule the heart and transform it. He must express himself in every smallest act of his votary. This can only be done through a definite realization more real than the five senses can ever produce. Sense perceptions can be and often are false and deceptive, however real they may appear to us. Where there is realization outside the senses, it is infallible. It is proved not by extre extraneous evidence, but in the transformed conduct and character of those who have felt the real presence of God within. Such testimony is to be found in the experiences of an unbroken line of prophets and sages in all countries and climes. To reject this evidence is to deny oneself. This realization is preceded by an immovable faith. He who would in his own person test the fact of God's presence can do so by a living faith. And since faith itself cannot be proved by extraneous evidence, the safest course is to believe in the moral government of the world, and therefore in the supremacy of the moral law, the law of truth and love. Exercise of faith will be the safest, where there is a clear determination, summarily, to reject all that is contrary to truth and love. I confess that I have no argument to convince through reason. Faith transcends reason. All I can advise is not to attempt the impossible.